Okay, hey everybody, Donnie Turner here from the Buying Tampa Bay podcast. Now, we're doing another Nuts and Bolts episode, and this one is probably the most important one. It's probably caused more headaches than anything else in our business, heartaches, headaches, uh, and everywhere in between. We're talking about maintenance. So honestly, in my opinion, the core of our business, I, I think our hosts would agree with me, but let me lob the ball onto them. So maintenance, guys, let's talk about it. Yeah, well, Donnie, it's good seeing you, by the way. And Chase, you too. Yeah, this is our first recording session we're doing with the video component. And uh, I don't know, we'll let our listeners decide if they prefer to hear our disembodied voices or to see our lovely faces. I mean, you guys are looking pretty good, if I do say so myself. Well, thank you. So, yeah, it's going pretty good so far. <laughs> All right. Let's see how so this video maybe. thing works. I'm not used to uh, being on video while we do this. So uh, I may have some contemplative looks as we discuss this. Right. Yeah, it might not be that pretty. Who knows? Pete Rose will be pretty, though, so just focus on him. Yeah, he's looking good behind you there. Look at that. He hustles like photo. a good handyman. Oh, my. Yes. Well, goodness. I mean, I think that is probably where I think is worth starting just in this. In property management, there's so much about it that is the coordination of, you know, all the different interests that impact you as a property manager or as an investor, right? You're an investor in a property and you've got a lot of relationships to manage. And it's what makes being an investor so challenging. It's why you make the big bucks, right? Because you're trying to manage the uh, interesting and sometimes very conflicted dynamics of the profitability of your portfolio, along with the satisfaction of your renter, along with the stakeholders that might exist in, in adjacency to your property that you own, the neighbors of your property, to the municipalities that have an interest to how well your properties are maintained. And of course, if you're a manager like us, we're caring a lot also about the owner and the owner's interest in preserving and maximizing their interests. And then we have vendors to bring into the picture because something's gone wrong at a property. And you know, by the way, property management is all about managing things that are going wrong. So it's almost never a happy day, right? When you're a property manager, you're working on problems and issues and you got to call a vendor and bring them into the picture. And guess what? That vendor's got their own business. So they don't always want to answer to you for at, at every beck and call. And they've got another dozen things going on right now. Maybe they're not dedicated to you. And so as a property manager or an investor, you're managing this really complicated dance, and trying to make sure that all of those objectives are brought into alignment for the maximum positive outcome. It's not easy. Yeah, and so maybe too, uh, you know, by way of disclaimer, there may be some of you out there listening to this saying, well, hey, I've got my own handymen that are on my payroll, and I control them every day from 8 to 5, and they're on call on the weekends and this and that. And if you've got enough density um, to do that in a very small geographic footprint, that's awesome. That is like maintenance bliss. Most of us don't have that kind of density or that kind of uh, capacity within a concentrated area to make that profitable. And so if you've got apartment complexes of significant size, that's great. That'll work. But what we're mainly talking about here is property managers like us that have properties spread out, you know, maybe over a hundred mile radius. And so you're dealing with third-party vendors and there's a big difference in how you handle a third-party vendor relationship and then how you handle your internal staff. So today that's kind of going to be our focus is talking about this third-party vendor relationship and how you manage maintenance inside a portfolio effectively using third parties. Yeah, that's, that's a great context and very important. We have had staff vendors, uh, the guys we've hired on to handle uh, work orders for us in our portfolios before. And we have had party vendor management uh, models in our property management companies. And both of those have worked well or poorly for various reasons. And most of that is contingent upon density. Where we've had dense units, we can have a staff model that's very effective. Where we have disparate units, far-flung units. Donnie, you've got units all over the country. So you can't sure. possibly have a staff maintenance guy, right? You've got to depend on local people to do the work for you. And so, well, it's, a, it, it's all about relationships, isn't it? I mean, isn't everything that we're talking about here about having the best possible relationship you can have with your fellow man and woman? 
And uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, can I ask a quick question about that before we move on? So yeah, the difference, the difference between having it in-house and third party, um, is there a difference in incentive structure? You know, I would assume the in-house, there may be on some kind of salary compared to being paid on job, or am I totally wrong on that? So yeah, how does that work? Yeah, typically, you know, I mean, when we did in-house, we had guys on payroll. So they were, they were either making an hourly, you know, wage or they were on salary. They were provided with a, a company van or truck in, in some situations. Sometimes we just provide them with a trailer full of tools and materials they needed that they then pull with their own vehicle. And we gave them a, a mileage allowance um, each month for their gas and wear and tear on their vehicle. Um, but yeah, it's quite different because then you're, you're compensating them sometimes, um, with an incentive plan that's based on how many work orders they complete Mm -hmm. and their level of efficiency, their level of quality, their level of, uh, interaction with the tenants, you know, that kind of thing versus a third party. You don't have much control over any of that other than how quick can they get it done? And is their price good? So. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Would, would you say there's one that's superior to the other? I've heard, you know, horror stories of uh, property managers that are basically creating work orders in thin air because they've created such an infrastructure that it needs to self-perpetuate because if they don't have enough work orders, if they don't have a large enough portfolio to um, rationalize having a vendor workforce, you get what I'm saying? They create this yeah. perpetuating problem. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's, it's definitely, a, it's very challenging to manage a in-house maintenance uh, model like what you're describing here with staff vendors, uh, staff technicians. That's a tough demographic to manage, right? And you're, you're piling on for yourself a bunch of management headaches that you're going to have just by virtue of the fact that you're dealing with people, right? And people's unique mm-hmm. problems. And what we often find with technicians is that the technicians are, are a certain class of demographic that has a certain type of problems, right? And those aren't always the easiest ones to handle. It's like yours and my problems aren't the easiest to handle either. You need to have skilled managers to manage people with those kinds of unique strengths and weaknesses. And so bringing in the right managers to handle your maintenance team is going to be headache number one. Headache number two is certainly making sure that team stays profitable. And so if you've got if you've got a staff guy, you want to make sure you're, you're paying him less than what you would pay um, – ordinary vendors to do the job for you, third-party vendors. Otherwise, it's not worth having. You, you should be going with whichever those models cost less long-term and over which you can have, you know, with all things being equal, you can have the greatest outcome. And so if you've got a scenario where you have a profit incentive or you want to keep your guys busy, then it's very easy to, you know, do work that you maybe shouldn't be doing, Right. Or it's very easy to make decisions like uh, uh, for you know utilization of your vendors to maximize efficiency for your company, and that that doesn't always get the job done the best way. Sometimes that job is going to require a lot of effort and time, and you've got a conflict of interest there if you're trying to manage that guy's time to get from that job onto something else that day, which yeah. is also an emergency. And if he's your only maintenance plumber, for example. You're not relying on an outside vendor to do some to provide you with some help. Well, then of course the tenant suffers because your guy is going all day at a job that he can't quite figure out, and the clock is ticking. Right, so you get the idea. I can go into I can go into lots of different directions, painting and describing the conflicts that exist when you have these models. And all it all it means really is that you've got to have a very skilled and a skilledly managed operation. So it's hard to do. And if you're not a skilled maintenance or contractor manager, then you might be buying off more than you can chew. Well, okay. So segue into uh, vendor relationships. I'm just thinking about it from the investor's perspective because, you know, some investors, maybe most investors assume that if you have in-house vendors, in-house maintenance guys, that it's going to be cheaper and it's going to be better and, and so forth. And I don't, I think you explained it very eloquently. That's not necessarily the case, right? So, um, yeah, having, having good vendor relationships, um, having them in house doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have great vendor relationships. Right. And it's not going to be in the best interest of the owner. Ultimately, that's right. Yeah. You've got to have, you can have your in-house guys. They can be doing good work for you, but you're almost always going to need good third parties as well. And lots of them because, Hey, you know, just like all of us, 
Your vendor is going to have a bad day. They're going to get in a car wreck. They're going to get tied up on a job. They're going to have a financial issue. Their tools are going to break. And lo and behold, you're going to send them a text or an email when that job comes around that you need them for. And they're not available, right? They're not available Mm -hmm. to you. They're not dedicated to you in a lot of cases. So you're going to have to have more than just one. And you're going to probably, the more units you own, find that you've got more than one big plumbing issue on one day. So you might need well more than one, right? And then you also might find changes in pricing as their pricing evolves. So you might need one that does really good job at white glove service, treating high-end properties very well. And you might also need a vendor that is really good on down and dirty jobs that, you know, aren't quite so cut and dry, who's very resourceful, for example, with an older property. So this just illustrates the importance of having lots of vendors and how many you might need to manage your disparate portfolio of investments. Yeah, so let me add to that real quick, because I think, you know, again, the key to having an in-house maintenance team is density. And so if you don't have density, it's probably not worth exploring because it's too expensive to run your guys and your trucks all over the place trying to perform maintenance. We learned this firsthand over a two or three year experiment that we did with this when we were managing several thousand units all over the state of Florida and found it to be marginally profitable. Like you have to run a very tight ship and you have to have lots of density to make that work. Um, The other thing is though to remember that it's a false premise to even let your owners believe that you can get them a quote unquote deal on maintenance. Um, They need to expect to pay market prices uh, because at the end of the day, if they're thinking you have an in-house guy that's going to get them some kind of a deal on fixing their stuff and you have to call that third party because your in-house guy isn't available, they need to be prepared to pay the market price. So it's better to set the expectation up front with your owners that they're always going to pay the market price. But that as a manager, we're going to do whatever we can to try and control costs across the board, whether that's doing more efficient scope of work, whether it's, you know, finding guys that are more efficient in their work and can charge us less because they can get it done faster. Um, whether it's in the materials we use, we'll try to manage that scenario as best we can, but there's no deal on maintenance. There's really not. And, um, we own properties and we know this firsthand, you know, um, but the benefits of having an in-house guy are control but it only works if you have density because you do have to manage them. You do have more skin in the game and it's not going to solve all your problems because you will need third parties. So, you know, I just remember some of that before you go out and try and hire someone, but regardless of whether you've got in-house or third party, you've still got to find the right people. And and this is where, you know, our, our next topic really comes in is, you know, how do we find these people, whether we're looking to hire someone on our staff or whether we're looking for a plumber or an AC guy, an electrician or a handyman, like where do we go to get these people? Because this is your biggest challenge in maintenance. Your biggest challenge is not handling an emergency. It's not the 2 a.m. call. It's not dealing with irate tenants. It's finding the right people to perform this task for you. And, you know, there's several, there's several tried and true uh, referral sources out there that you can go to that I would recommend you explore right off the bat. And one of those is your Home Depot or Lowe's Pro Desk. Um, Because these guys see vendors day in, day out that come through Home Depot or Lowe's buying materials for jobs. They get to know them. They know how busy they are. And all that put together kind of forms an opinion or a, um, an educated perspective on how good or bad this person is. Are they organized? Do they come in with a list? Are they coming back to the store all day long because they forgot this or forgot that? You know, these pro desk people know that. And I've gotten some really good referrals over the years from my Home Depot and Lowe's pro desk uh, reps. And that's a great place to go to start your search for finding uh, good vendors exactly right. You know, I, I also think about the vendors that we've gotten through just good recommendations from other landlords, right? Or, you know, Googling a good vendor and lo and behold, they're good and they're reliable and they're affordable. And the misnomer is, and Chase hit on it earlier, is that if you go to Google or you go to Angie and you look for a vendor that you're going to be paying top of market pricing, we're not always. 
you're going to be paying market pricing, right? But again, you get what you pay for and you get a dependable, reliable person who knows how to use electronic systems. And that's really important for a vendor because a guy who is good at swinging a hammer is not always a guy who's good at using a computer, right? So you need to have a guy who can do both if you want a business or a system that can grow. And so using some conventional resources are totally fine, perfectly acceptable. And like Chase said, you're not necessarily going to get the best deal going, uh, you know, the best price out there. But you might get the, the right price because it will come with less hassle and a little bit more professionalism. So use all of these tactics that are available to you and try lots of guys. Don't worry. You're going to try a plumber now and you're going to have an opportunity to try a plumber again next month. So maybe try someone new if the one you got this month wasn't great for you. Right. Yeah. And uh, real quick, two other suggestions on that. Number one, realize that if you're managing properties across a disparate area uh, with a wide berth of geography, the one plumber can't service your whole portfolio. If you're trying to run, uh, if you're managing properties in Newport Ritchie, there are plumbers in Newport Ritchie and you need to find one because your Tampa plumber is not going to service Newport Ritchie. Um, so just keep that in mind. The more you ask of these vendors to do things that's kind of outside of the normal scope of what they do, the more difficult your relationship's going to become because it's going to be harder on them and they're going to charge you more for that. Or you're going to be sending them in their vehicle across the county, wasting time doing that instead of actually working on your service calls. So I'd recommend finding, finding specialized vendors and handymen if you can in each geographic region that you manage in and don't have any of them driving more than 30 minutes one way or another to do a job um, because that will make them efficient and it keeps them happy because they don't like driving an hour, hour and a half to a job. Nobody does. Sure. Um, and so that's just one recommendation there. And then the second thing is just because you find a good vendor today doesn't mean they're going to be a good vendor next month or the next year. Um, it is truly relationship management. Um, some of these guys work literally job to job, paycheck to paycheck and external things going on in their lives, whether it be a new girlfriend, whether it be having to move, whether it be their truck breaking down, whatever the case can severely impact their ability to perform the jobs you're asking them to perform on a timely basis and for the price that they should be charging. So it does require vigilance on your part as a property manager and a constant management of that relationship and monitoring things that go on so that you can get a feel for where they are in their headspace and their ability to perform. Yeah, that's, that's we such talk a, a little good bit more. Point. Sorry. I was just going to say a how more? Good, Yeah. Go ahead, Donnie. <laughs> can we talk a little bit more about that, about like maturing relationships with vendors? Um, I'm thinking in my head, I have a scenario like you meet a young vendor, maybe, you know, he's young in his career. He doesn't have a lot of jobs. He doesn't know a lot of people that will give him jobs. So maybe he wants to earn your business a little bit. Maybe he's willing to work a little bit harder. Maybe he's willing to do you a favor here and there or even do work at a reduced rate. But then, you know, um, you keep working with him and then maybe he gets more accounts and then all of a sudden he's too busy. So now, you know, he doesn't really want to get out of his way to do with you. And maybe he he will do it if you're willing to pay a little bit more. You know, and it's just, I think you, you're going into it, but if we could talk a little bit more about that, just um, maintaining that relationship and, and watching that relationship mature. Do you right. have any comments on that? Yeah, because what you're dealing with, guys, is you have, entre these guys are entrepreneurs on their own right, right? They may not look like you or I or business like you or I, but they are entrepreneurs and they have their own interests they're trying to build and develop. And so they will say yes to a lot of stuff early on in, your, in your, the early stages of your relationship while they feel you out as a client. And maybe they'll drive to Newport Ritchie one day for you because it's a long way away, but they're willing to do it because they're the only job they have, right? Well, you've got to be savvy enough as a manager of their time to not keep sending them out there if you know that's not where they live or not where most of their jobs are because otherwise they will get jaded with you. They will try to charge you more, right? And so you're, you're staying constantly aware, just like a good friend does, a good manager does, of what's going on in their businesses and their life so that you're giving them the kind of work they want to do in the areas that they want to do it. It's why we need so many vendors, right? Because that's a moving target for these vendors. They don't even know from month to month necessarily where they want to work or what kind of work they want to do. 
So really getting to know them well and what they like and where their skills are is critically important. And by, by the way, they all have different skill sets. So you found yourself a great handyman, right? He's probably really good at some uh, services, but not others. And so, but he might tell you he's really good at everything. So you're going to dispatch him to a job and you're going to discover that he's horrible at drywall, right? But he's really good at plumbing and electrical and other small items that, that, might, that might fit within his skill set. But his drywall finishing is the worst, right? So you might not know that. You might not find that out until too late as you, try, as you get used to this guy. And maybe you don't want to penalize him for it, right? Because where he comes from in his world, his drywall job is good enough. But it's not good enough for your class A single family home. So you're going to use a different vendor for drywall in the future, right? You'll keep using him for the handyman work, but you use a different drywall guy later on. This is about you as an investor really understanding people's strengths and weaknesses so you can make the best decisions. Yeah, so practically speaking, a couple of things I'll I'll add to that. Um, When you go to interview a vendor and you know they're new, they they haven't got a whole lot of experience doing this, there's a couple of questions you can ask them that can kind of help you vet, I think, you know, where they're at in their career, what they understand about what they're trying to do. Number one, Peter touched on is, you know, what are your specialties? You know, they can't be a jack of all trades. Like those never work. I mean, very rarely can anybody do everything. Probably never can everybody really do everything well. Another thing is what area do you work in? It's like, oh, I'll go anywhere bad sign that that's not going to work for anyone going anywhere. And the other thing is what kind of systems are you using to manage your workload? So if they say, Oh, you know, well, I just, I'll just text you the price. That's not, that's not always a good thing. They need a system. They need like some kind of a scheduling system, at least a calendar they're using. They need a billing system. They need to be able to create invoices typically in some way. And, We've been fortunate that we've used a couple of guys that don't have all this really buttoned up and put together, but it's because they do exceptional work and we got lucky. Mm -hmm. I think the tried and true way to do this is to make sure that whoever you're working with is organized, they have a method to the madness, and they know what they want to do and they know what they do well. So I, I try and focus on those things, try and sleuth that out in some way from any perspective, you know, vendor or handyman that you're going to engage in work. That's right. And for every one of those things that Chase just mentioned, the cost goes up, right? So just keep that in mind. And you have to have it. You've got to have a guy who actually has a company because it's a requirement for you to report to the IRS money that you've paid to your vendors in excess of 500 bucks a year. So if they don't have a company that they've set up, if they don't have a tax ID number for that, well, you can't do that. And so you've got some issues on your hands. But if a guy does have a company, he's a more sophisticated vendor and is probably going to charge more. And he's probably got insurance. He's probably got other things that make him more expensive. Well, all those things are important for you to have, right? If if you're going to do this job for real. So, but they all impact the bottom line. And so you just keep that in mind as you're an investor. Yeah, got to have insurance. That's a key. Um, we know that from experience, they got to have their liability insurance covered. And if they've got employees that work for them, more than four in the state of Florida, they also have to carry workers' compensation insurance. Mm-hmm. If they have less than four employees, they can have an exemption, but you need to see their exemption certificate. And, you know, that may sound like, you know, we're splitting hairs, making people do tough things, but your insurance company as a property manager is going to require you to produce evidence of these things for the vendors that you engage. And so getting it up front is a whole lot better than trying to get it after the fact. And so our policy is we don't release money to any vendor if we don't have their insurance on file, their workers' compensation exemption, or their W-9 form so that we can comply with 1099 reporting requirements with the IRS. So um, those are important things. Um, Easy to overlook, seem like trivial items, but if you don't do them, it's going to cost you money, I promise. I know this from experience. Yeah. All right, right, so then I I guess the next thing is, so we've got these vendors, we've got, you know, the guys that we feel like we need to do this, so 
now we've got tenants that have already been calling in, right? Tenants are saying, you know, hey, my closet doors fell off the track. Uh, my AC is broken. I don't have any hot water. You know, my faucet's dripping. You know, I've got a roof leak, you know? So they're, they're calling in. Oh, no, they're texting you as the property manager. You've given them your cell phone number. Ugh. Maybe you shouldn't have done that, right? You're feeling like that was a bad move. All right, so one suggestion we have is take your maintenance requests in writing only. And uh, we, we utilize PropertyWare. We've talked about that in the past. The tenant portal provides a way for tenants to submit maintenance requests. And it's done in writing. It's done through the portal. So we have an official record of it when it came in, what they're asking for. And we also ask them to submit a photo or photos of the issue so that we can help them diagnose it. We'll be back after a quick break. We hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Right. So writing and photos help de-emotionalize the process. And so you need to be able to hear what's going on without the frustration sometimes in the voice. And so a written explanation of that problem makes that better. And then pictures make it as objective as it could possibly be, pictures or video. That way you know exactly uh, what you're getting into. And, of course, if you have them send over pictures, if it's an appliance you're dealing with, send over pictures of the serial number and the model number of the appliance. That way you can know at a glance what kind of appliance it is and how old it is and, man, whether or not it's worth repairing. What if it's a 20-year-old refrigerator, right? And you know that now from the serial number then it might not be best for this owner or for you as the investor to repair. Maybe it's replacement time, right? If it's new, it's like less than a year old, you might have, have relative certainty that there's a warranty that you should be calling on to fix that appliance, right? Or that air conditioner. Or maybe when you get the pictures, you can cross-reference it with the, with the past uh, vendor invoices that you have to know if this was put in by a vendor recently. Like it's an air conditioning system that's less than five years old. Maybe that's still under warranty as well. So all these pictures help you cross-check and verify all kinds of things to make your triage, your diagnosis, and your dispatch of the vendor easier. And also, I might point out that, you know, getting it in writing, especially in a manner that is, you know, documented in a tenant portal like we do through PropertyWare or any other software that provides that kind of service, it also puts you in compliance with the law in the state of Florida and that, you know, owners or property managers are expected to comply with a maintenance request within seven days of it being submitted in writing. And so that, you know, that, that kind of helps both sides know, Hey, when did it come in? What was the request? You know, what did the documentation look like so that you can move forward? Um, and we asked for those photos and videos for diagnosis purposes as well. Um, that, that's one thing that, that I think people underestimate when they go into this maintenance process is how expensive it is to send someone to the property versus being able to sleuth it out or diagnose it over the phone or through chat or video or, you know, educating your tenant on how maybe they can solve the problem. Because every time you roll a truck out there, it's probably at least $75, whether that's a charge coming from a third-party vendor, whether that's the, the gas and the time to send your in-house guy out there. I just don't see how in today's, mar today's market with the cost and structure in place that you can roll a truck to a property for any less than $75. So um, documentation up front with the request is extremely important so that you can prevent rolling a truck if you can. Right, right. Yeah, the diagnosis process is so critical. And then the self-service process, as much as you can possibly get it done, too. You know, either the fact that you're going to talk to the vendor once you, or the, the tenant. Once you get that uh, tenant a request, uh, it's emailed in to you. 
now you can review that and you can call the renter yourself and ask any additional questions. So let's say he sends you a picture of an outlet that isn't working. Well, you need to call him up to find out if that's an outlet that's connected to a GFI circuit or if they've checked their breaker boxes for, for a tripped breaker because maybe it's just something that simple, right? And so your conversation on the phone with the renter will help the renter diagnose some of those issues on their own. Or if there's an issue with a, with a toilet or an air conditioning unit and it's relatively simple, you know it's simple, but it might be hard to communicate. Well, that's a perfect candidate for sending over a YouTube video to that tenant on how to do it on their own. And Home Depot has got a deep library of do-it-yourself fix-it videos that are wonderfully easy. How to plunge a toilet, how to trip a breaker, how to flush an air conditioning drain line, how to do any number of things, right? These are videos that you ought to send to the renter so they can do it themselves, especially because in many cases, that maintenance call that comes in on the phone is actually the renter's responsibility, right? And that's one of the most important, maybe most overlooked things that property managers and owners do is they don't correctly identify who's responsible for the maintenance call that's coming in. So the tenant calls in and their light bulb is burnt out, right? That's kind of an obvious one. Probably shouldn't be the responsibility of the management company or the landlord to fix that. But a whole lot of landlords are going to get that call and be like, oh my goodness, I've got to be responsive to my render, my tenant. I'm going to get someone out there to fix that light bulb. That is the renter's responsibility. And we need to make sure that we put that responsibility back on the renter again. The list goes on. I mean, Chase, you've got a great list of items that are renter responsibilities, right? Yeah, you know, and, and, and all this, remember, is governed by the lease um, and by, you know, your lease should line up with your with your state law, you know, but uh, our, our lease states, you know, and, and we've done this for years, the tenants are responsible for anything that's going to cost less than $200 to fix, um, which isn't much these days, you know, we haven't really uh, increased that number in the last 15 or 20 years, but but that does cover a multitude of things from light bulbs to air filters to doorknobs sometimes to, you know, even light bulbs in refrigerators and under microwaves and filters for those appliances and things like that. Um, and, you know, the, the renters these days have come to this mindset that, you know, they don't have to touch anything, right? They, they call the property manager or the leasing office for, anything and everything that doesn't work exactly like it's supposed to. And someone's going to go and take care of that for them. And um, that's just not technically how this works. And you don't want to get into the position as a property manager where you are fueling that fire because those types of things are the quickest ways to erode the profitability uh, of this property for your owner. And so being diligent, like Peter said, to assess responsibility is critical. Um, we're talking about things like pressure washing sometimes, right? You know, you're renting out a single family home in an HOA neighborhood. You've provided your tenant the rules and regulations for the HOA. And one of them is that the driveway and the sidewalk has to be pressure washed. Well, if you've disclosed that to the tenant, that responsibility lies with them, you know, and they may, they may bark about it and say, you know, that's, that's, and that's not my responsibility, pressure washing, complying with the HOA. But at the end of the day, that's cleaning. I mean, if they moved into a pressure wash driveway and now it needs pressure washing, you know, that's, uh, that's something that's governed by your lease. But in our lease, that's on them. So um, we try as best we can to walk that line between what's a reasonable expectation to lay on the tenant versus what are we legally allowed to do according to our lease and it's definitely more of an art than a science sometimes. And it varies by property because every property is different and it comes with its own unique set of circumstances and, and requirements. And if you've got a 35 foot ceiling in some mansion somewhere with, you know, $35 LED light bulbs that you can't fix without bringing a scissor lift inside the house, you know, you need to, you need to consider that when you go to rent the property as the owner and then you also need to make sure that you make the tenant aware of that if you're going to try and put that burden on them when they move in. That's a great, those are great insights. I mean, I'm looking through the list that we send out to our renters at the commencement of their lease with us, that it's their responsibility. And it's really pretty rigorous. And I'm looking through some of these things. I'm thinking, man, a lot of renters I know 
a lot of millennials, but a lot of seniors too, right? They can't do some of these things on this list, right? They're, some of these things are going to be hard for them. So how do you balance that reality, Chase? I mean, in your conversations with your renters, you know, the, the millennial renter or the slightly physically impaired or, hey, maybe it's just a technically impaired person, right? They don't like to do this kind of work. Like, how do you get them to do it? Well, I, th- I think there's so many things. And, and I know probably in a subsequent episode, we'll go into how to orient a tenant to a property. But the bottom line is you have got to disclose and educate your tenants up front either on the day they move in or before they move in. Um, And ideally, before they even sign the lease, maybe at the showing, you're pointing out to them some of these items that are going to come up during their tenancy, potentially come up, I should say. Um, There's there's no substitute for walking them through the property up front, showing them all these possible things that they're going to be responsible for, and explaining to them, look, if you can't perform this on your own, Here's one of our preferred vendors that can do pressure washing for you. Or here's a handyman that you can hire because it's your responsibility to replace these light bulbs on your 35 foot high ceiling. You know, or here's a guy that is really good at cleaning out gutters, you know, because that's your responsibility per the lease. Um, So, you know, no substitute for uh, informing the tenant up front, educating them. And even letting them know, hey, look, we're here to help you. Even though this is your responsibility, we can help you find people to perform these duties for you if you need them. That's a great one. I really like that ending there because at the end of the day, if they can't do this stuff, it's just going to be a cost to them, right? But it should be their cost, not the owner's cost or the investor's cost, right? So We'll go right ahead and dispatch a vendor to get that work done for you, Mr. Tenant, that will replace that light bulb. But that's going to be a cost to you, and that's going to hit your ledger, and you're going to pay that with your rent. And you get a buy-in from them on that. You'll probably get a thank you from them on that. These are guys who can't do this on their own sometimes, and they might be very appreciative of the fact that you'll do it for them. But you're right. This renting is not a concierge lifestyle. They're not living in a hotel, Right. And I think that's a very important nego- that's a very important orientation element, letting them know when they move into this property, they're not going to get room service or butler service, right? That's they right, won't man. get a bath butler. Now, now I will say one thing that I do like to do, especially in HOA neighborhoods, and, and this is something you could consider maybe with some other items, but sometimes I'll provide lawn service included in the rent for the tenant because I know that this tenant is probably not capable of maintaining a pristine St. Augustine yard. And I know the cost of doing that. And so I'll tack the cost of doing that onto the rent. And then I, as the property manager, will manage that for them in-house with a vendor. And uh, there are times that you want to do that. and, And sometimes it's an assessment of the renter's capability Sometimes it's an assessment of the property itself and what the HOA might be requiring and what the cost to replace, a, you know, a 5,000 square foot St. Augustine yard might be, which is quite expensive. Um, so there are some opportunities there where you could go to the tenant and be like, hey, look, I know you're going to have a problem, you know, doing this or doing that. So when the time comes, whether it be a monthly service, biweekly service, whatever that is, We'll perform this for you, but here's the cost. And we're going to bill this to you at X rate. And, you know, you're going to agree to it right now by signing this form. And that's how we're going to do it. Yeah, that's very shrewd, I think. Okay, so I guess to round up what we talked about, we talked about our vendor relationships. We talked about pretty much the tenant relationships. And, you know, the tenant, you know, is, you know, let's say, I mean, this is the tried true story, right? There's a reason why they call it tenants and toilets. You know, the 2 a.m., the house is flooding. You know, the the (laughs) toilet's backed up, you know? So let's connect the dots on this between the vendors and the tenants. How how do we dispatch the vendors? How do we get the vendors to, you know, save the day for the tenants? Well, Well, can I just make the comment to set everyone's mind at ease? In the 15 years that I've been managing properties, the 2 a.m. call is a very, very rare item. It almost never happens, right? So most people are also asleep at 2 a.m. 
And, it, you know, there, there's occasionally a house fire where we'll have someone call because their house is burning. And we're like, 911 is your right call, <laughs> right? And, and don't even call me until, like, the fire's put out and your family are safely out of the house. You're right? giving so away you our got, secrets, and, man. You know what? You're giving away our secrets. I know, I know. People well, need property okay. managers for those 2 a.m. calls. <laughs> you're right. Be really afraid of the possibility of that 2 a.m. call. Because when it comes, you're not going to want to do it, right? You're gonna, you're definitely going to want your property manager to do it. We're an insurance policy for you, right? But the vendor does serve like this. They're, they are to the rescue, right? You're the property manager. You're going you're gonna to arrange for the vendor to go out and do the job. But in an ideal system... You're going to give that vendor the work order to go out and do that job, whatever kind of job it is. And that vendor is going to reach out to the tenant. They're going to call the tenant. They're going to try to arrange a good time to show up that works for the tenant and the vendor. Remember, you've got two schedules there to manage. And as a third-party property manager or investor owner, that's a very hard thing to do. You can barely handle your own schedule, right? So allow the vendor and the tenant to work together to manage the actual maintenance, uh, the, the most appropriate time to show up and do the maintenance, right? And then allowing that contact to happen means the tenant, the vendor shows up when the tender, the vendor, the, excuse me, the tenant wants them there. You're not going to believe how many times the vendor show up to a property and the tenant isn't there or it's not convenient for them to show up, right? And so when you allow those two parties to talk, it's a whole lot easier. Yeah, and I'll say this too, you know, as far as the emergencies go, the one thing you probably want to have in your Rolodex is an emergency plumber. And it's not necessarily for drain backups, because drain backups can be handled, you know, during the regular work hours. Um, You know, even if someone's up at 2am using the bathroom, that's typically not going to send things over the edge to where the apartment's going to back up, you know, and flood everything, right? It's the showers, it's the, you know, incessant running of water that does that kind of thing and hopefully people aren't doing that at 2 a.m you know and if they are and the thing starts to back up they can shut the water off and stop that process but the things you can't control sometimes are the water heaters that explode and the pipes that burst and you know the faucets that fall off the wall or whatever might happen you know in the middle of the night because somebody's stumbling around or whatever and keeping a plumber handy that does respond to 24 hour emergencies, I think is a really good idea. And I would shop them because they don't all have the same rate and their rates are not always, you know, exorbitant for doing these after hours calls. And we found a good one who is only charges a $75 premium to come out after hours, which is really not too bad at all. And they're available on 24 hour dispatch. Uh, So look around and find an emergency plumber Because of all things that need to be addressed at the time that they happen, it's a flood situation. Um, Floods are things that can cause extraordinary damage, not just to your unit, but if you're upstairs, it can cause damage to the unit below you. And and you've got a lot of liability involved with that. Um, So my recommendation is just find an emergency plumber. Everything else can wait, honestly. That's right. You know, plumbing is certainly falls into the emergency category. There's other things that you might classify as an emergency situation. Certainly anything that's that's likely going to cause a fire would be an, a situation to be resolved. But most of those things are we're not discovering at midnight, right? Maybe even an arcing break, an arcing outlet is not discovered usually at two in the morning. It's the following day. So you want to get someone out to that really quickly if it's a business hour situation. But it's probably not a middle of the night thing, whereas plumbing is. Here's another thing that's not an emergency: air conditioning. It, I, my wife sometimes thinks it is. I sometimes think it is. If my wife is expecting a baby, she definitely thinks it is. <laughs> right? I mean, like who doesn't? It's Florida. It's 100 degrees outside. But the law does not call an air conditioning outage an emergency. Interestingly, the law does call having no heater an emergency. So you've got to resolve a tenant without heat, right? And I think the premise is no heat, you could freeze to death. Too hot, you need a shower, right? You sweat a little bit more, right? And I think that's the distinction in, uh, in the minds of a law. But there are things that are emergency that require prompt service and prompt care. And there's other things that people just get really agitated about and that they think are emergencies in their mind. So 
as an investor, as a property manager, you need to be able to tap dance that communication very carefully. When that angry person calls because their air conditioner is out and it's a Sunday morning, you're right. And they want an emergency after hours air conditioning guy to come out and fix that air conditioning for them. That's a tough conversation to have, but that's generally not a, yes, I'm going to dispatch immediately an emergency AC guy for you because it's Sunday, right? And it's going to cost the owner a whole lot more money to do that. You a whole lot more money to do that. Usually that's a conversation that's like, we can get someone out there as soon as we possibly can. If you want to pay the emergency fee for the rush service, we can get someone out there today. But your lease and the law do tell you what's an emergency, and this air conditioning outage is not one of them. So tough conversations to have. You might want to have, handle them a different way as an investor. You might want to make air conditioning an emergency item because it's really important to you to have air conditioning, and it is for your, you want to apply that same standard to your renter. But keep in mind that you don't have to. Yeah, you know, in, a, in Florida, you know, this kind of summer that we've had where it's been extremely hot, extremely humid, we haven't got the kind of rainfall we typically get in the Tampa Bay area. We've had an inordinate amount of AC condensation drain line backups this summer that cause units to shut down because the float switch engages. And so from, from a, a diagnosis and triage standpoint for AC, one quick thing that people can do is, hey, look, do you have a shop vac? If not, go buy one for 50 bucks at the store. Walmart's usually open 24 seven and suck the gunk out of your drain line and get your AC unit back and up and running. You know, we don't have to dispatch an emergency AC tech for that kind of stuff. And we can give the tenants the option of, Hey, look, here's a way you can fix it yourself. Or you can wait until Monday morning, possibly, or Monday afternoon when in, in normal business hours an AC tech can get out to you. So there are some, there are some things like that that you can offer the tenant to kind of mitigate those really hot and heavy expecting a baby circumstances. Right. I think it's also worth saying that we have expectations from our renters that we want to meet. We have owner's expectations. They don't want to deal. They don't want to pay emergency costs. If you're an investor, you don't want to have to handle that. There are other bodies that are outside of ordinary, like legislative channels that really do have a lot of say here. You must be aware of them. Think about code enforcement. Think about if you're a Section 8 landlord, the housing authority who inspects your property. Think about the media, right, and the impact that the media can have if a tenant is really angry at the way you're keeping a property and they're going to want to take it out on you and they're going to want to call eight on your side or whoever the investigative journalist in your area is to come out and talk about what a slum landlord you are because you're not fixing a problem promptly. Or the Section 8 authority wants to be called out by your renter to address and look at your property because you haven't fixed a certain repair and they're going to abate or hold back your rent until that uh, repair is is made. Or a tenant decides to call code enforcement because they think your house is a dump. And the code enforcement inspector comes through and that, guys, those laws are often very uh, subjectively interpreted and enforced by the inspector who comes through your property. And so they decide on their own that your property doesn't meet certain building codes and certain quality standards of living. And they impose a pretty rigorous standard of repair on you. All of these things can happen because we're dealing with emotions and people and complex systems. And all of them are very expensive. So if you're a landlord and you're inclined to be a slumlord to not address repairs as they come up, Keep in mind that these costs that we've just described right here can be very expensive, very difficult to navigate. And these are quasi-governmental almost authorities that you really ought to pay attention to and be considerate of, given the impact they can have on the performance of your investment property. Yeah, you're probably even more than consideration. Like, you must comply. (laughs) You don't have a choice. If you don't, they'll stop a lien on your property so fast and rack up a fine that, you know, can be more than the property's worth in a very short period of time. I think, too, the other perspective is from the property manager's perspective is to how do you handle an owner who doesn't want to comply with these things, who, you know, thinks the property's just fine. The tenant accepted the property as is, even with all these code violations. So why should I have to fix it? They're paying under market rent, right? You've got all these things to consider. 
And at the end of the day, you know, you need to make sure that as a property manager, you've communicated to your owner before you ever move a tenant into a property about potential issues or things that must be fixed in order to comply with code or that will prevent you from having a major problem down the road. Uh, Sometimes it's unforeseen. Sometimes the tenants cause all this damage and create all these code violations. But A lot of the times it's because initially the property wasn't quite maybe where it needed to be when you move someone in. And we can speak from experience that it's never a good idea to move a tenant in for sub-market rent in a subpar property that does not meet the the code standards. Um, Don't do it. You got to spend the money. You got to get the property up to par. If the owner refuses to do that, You need to consider as a property manager whether or not you want to manage that property because you will be liable in some way, shape, or form for what happens at that property. When the tenant decides to file a lawsuit, you as the property manager will be listed on that lawsuit. I guarantee it. So just consider the relationship that you're going to have with your owner and whether or not the owner is going to do what they need to do to make the property rentable according to the local municipal standard. Right. I mean, housing is a, is a necessary need with deep social implications. And it speaks to the essence of, of, of people's identity speaks to their family comfort and safety. You can't be a slumlord. You just can't, you've got to, take seriously your responsibility in giving a quality of life to your renters that, uh, that ought to reflect some degree of the golden rule. Everyone lives at different standards. So you don't have to enforce your standard or you place your standard on them, but you certainly can't allow a tenant to go on living below what is considered humane or appropriate for wherever it is that you are. And in the United States, in the area, in the era of social media, that's a relatively high standard of living. You cannot, you can't butt up against that standard of living with impunity. People are going to hold you accountable for it. And I think your conscience ought to as well, because you're clearly a blessed person with the ability to invest in real estate. That means you have an obligation to do something good for people too. And that is do the repairs that are necessary on their property. Don't be that landlord. Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, so getting us back, I guess, into you know the nuts and bolts of what we're doing here with maintenance management. Really, the last two things to consider are communication, coordination, and then the cost involved with doing this, right? And so, you know, as a property manager, you're you're involved in a three way communication triangle. Basically, you've got this communication going on where after you dispatch the work order to a vendor, they've got to communicate with a tenant to schedule the repair. Then that vendor has got to communicate back with you about what the scope of work is that's needed and what the estimated cost will be. And then you've got to communicate that with the owner and say, hey, owner, here's what needs to be done at your property and here's what it's going to cost. And when they give you the approval to do it, now you're back to the vendor saying, yeah, vendor, go ahead and do that work. And then the vendor's going back to the tenant saying, okay, I can come on Tuesday at 10 o'clock to get this done. And so it's kind of a complicated, you know, web of communication there that has to occur. And it all has to occur because you've got to keep all three of these parties involved and coordinated in getting this issue resolved. Um, So there's some things that can help you with that. In terms of software, um, you know, portal usage, things like that. But at the end of the day, it's going to take some time and some effort to successfully coordinate and communicate a man's problem all the way through to its resolution. Right. And then, of course, don't forget the actual communication ultimately with the owner to approve the expenses and to make sure that he's fully kept in the loop of what all is going on there. The last thing you're going to want is to surprise him with whatever the issue was and whatever the cost was associated with it. So lots of complicated needs there. That's what a good property manager does. This, they, they kind of step into the gap here and they fill all of these communication needs with their expertise and their efficiency. They're contextualizing and describing the situations in ways that everyone can understand and making that smooth. It's a big, big part of the job. 
Yeah, we don't like billing surprises, right? And that that's really that causes probably the most conflict in your relationship between a property manager, a vendor, and an owner, right? Is unexpected cost. You know, an estimate may come in for 300 bucks to fix an issue. Then the vendor gets into it, gets out there, has to put a few more parts into it, has to spend a little bit more time on it, and sends you the invoice for $500. And you've already told the owner, hey, look, it was going to be a $300 repair, but now the invoice is $500. And you as the property manager now have to determine, okay, well, is this fair, right? Is the vendor assessing me for things that really needed to happen? And is what they're assessing true to market cost and need, and actually was required in order to you know fulfill the resolution of this maintenance? And why didn't they know this up front, right? Why, why didn't they tell me up front it was going to be 500 instead of 300? Because now I've got to go back to this owner and pitch the bad news, right? And I mean, unfortunately, in this business, we're pitching bad news to owners more often than good news, I think, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's just part of the deal. Um, so... That's a sticky situation that, you know, you find yourself in fairly regularly, honestly, you know, in this business and um, something that you've got to navigate through. I don't know that there's any real tried and true way to prevent that from happening. Uh, sometimes you've got to go to the vendor and say, look, no, we're not paying 500. We're only paying 300 because this is what you told us and we didn't authorize that, you know. And then sometimes you got to go to the owner and be like, look, you know. This vendor, you know, really knows what he's doing. This was unforeseen. Here's why. And you got to, you know, fork over another 200 bucks to get this resolved. That's right. You know, the the reason for all this fundamentally is because a house isn't an object, right? In this, in this classic sense of, of the word, you've got thousands of objects all colliding together in one structure. And those objects are impacted by wear and tear and age of build, and location, and quality of construction, and just a host of other factors. So you don't really know when you're going in to fix a faucet on a sink, right? What you're dealing with, right? What's the vintage of the supply lines for the water, right? How is the faucet connected to the countertop? Uh, What kind of uh, what kind of water shutoff issue are you going to have when you get to that house? right? The the list goes on and on. Can you find a replacement part that fits the holes in the countertop or you have to modify the the countertop to allow for the placement of this faucet? A simple faucet replacement might be such an easy job on a home built five years ago and an extremely complicated job on a home built 30 years ago. And so how do you even price for that? When when you're warning the owner that you have a job that's going to, a faucet to replace, what do you even tell him? Is a job is a job a hundred dollar job or is it a four hundred dollar job? Right? You don't even know because all those things can impact that cost substantially, and the vendor might have to go out multiple times because he can't figure it out the first time. So, what you're going to ask the vendor to eat all of those trip costs every time they've got to go out? Is that their responsibility? Well, of course not. Right? It's the owner's house; it needs to be fixed. And if we had complete information, we could answer that question up front, maybe. But even then, once you dig inside the wall or you underco- or you go under the sink, you discover a whole new set of problems you didn't know existed. That's what makes this costing issue so complicated from a maintenance standpoint. And a good property manager can explain that to an owner. A good investor understands that once they've heard it, right? And we try to be fair in how we pass those costs and expenses along. And I think, too, you know, I, I, this is one thing where I think at home prop, we have a little bit of a competitive advantage over your run of the mill property manager, because, you know, one thing we try to do is we, we do just like we would do a tenant orientation when we're moving a tenant into a property to explain and disclose up front some of the things they're going to have to do as a tenant when they live in this property. We like to do the same thing with the owner. You know, when we take on a new property, we like to walk the property with the owner and explain to them where we see possible maintenance liability, whether that be in, you know, old corroded pipes or, you know, fault or aged AC systems or countertops that are crumbling underneath the formica layer on top, you know, and just tell them up front, Hey, look, you know, you, you may not have much more useful life on this item or that item, or you may have one more tenant out of this carpet, you know, uh, kind of thing so that they know up front when they get that call 
about, you know, plumbing leaks under the sink or things like that, you can remind them, hey, remember we discussed this in the orientation, you know, you've got corroded valves under your sink that don't even turn on and off. So we got to shut the water off at the, at the street to do any kind of repair. They really need to be replaced. And that's why when the plumber got in there, we incurred the extra, you know, $150, $200 of cost because we had to replace the whole thing. We couldn't just repair the valve. Um, that goes a long way, I think, in establishing credibility with the owner when you're informing them of these things up front during a walkthrough. And you can help remind them when these maintenance issues come up that, hey, look, remember we looked at this and, you know, this was kind of a gap in your, in your property that we've now fixed for you. So hopefully you won't have this problem now for another 10 or 15 years. Great stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I guess the last thing that I'll just add as we uh, kind of wrap up this conversation on maintenance coordination is um, related to the flow of money. Um, just remember that, you know, as a property manager, rents collected on the first of the month or around the first of the month. And at Home Prop, we disperse that rent to owners on the 10th. Um, everything that we've collected first through the 10th goes out to the owner on the 10th of the month. So when maintenance repairs come in after the 10th, you know, let's say one comes in on the 12th or the 15th of the month, that owner doesn't have money in their account to immediately pay the vendor. And so we can go full circle now back to this idea of relationship, because one thing that you need to establish with your vendors um, is the pay cycle of when you as the property manager will have money to disperse to them and when they can expect to get paid based on when they invoice. Timely invoicing from the vendor is critical so that you, the owner can see the cost, the cost can be recorded on the ledger, and that when funds become available, the vendor can get paid. And the other thing that we do at Home Prop is we like to e-pay everyone. Um, you know, cutting checks is kind of, you know, a uh, thing of the last decade, and ePay is much more reliable, much more trackable, and the vendors end up getting their money a lot faster than if we put a check in the mail. And uh, so we recommend that process to you. We love that process, and we require that of all of our vendors to uh, provide us with their bank information so that we can ePay them. And that way they can get paid when I'm in my car sitting next to the property on my phone. I don't have to go to the office and print a check. You know, and so if funds are available, we can get the funds flowing faster that way. So just a few tips and tricks that uh, we employ at Home Prop and we'd recommend to you as well. I love it. Well, guys, thank you for your time today. I'm really loving this nuts and bolts series because, I mean, it's just real good, actionable content. And it may be simple to you guys, but even for people like me, new to the game or for investors that are, you know, I like to bag on the California investors since I was once a California investor. But those California investors that have never swung a hammer before, you know, I, I, I've gotten a lot out of it. So thank you, guys. It's been great. Um, our pleasure. Thanks, Donnie. Thanks, Donnie. Yeah. Have a good day. Hey there, it's Peter Murphy with Buying Tampa Bay. Are you an investor who has ever wanted to own real estate in Tampa Bay? Or do you currently have real estate and want to grow your portfolio at a few new investment properties? Or maybe you just need some awesome property management to de-stress your life. Well, here's what I found. Home Prop is hands down the best real estate investment brokerage in Tampa Bay. And they can help you build wealth in real estate, which is right in line with our podcast mission to build wealth in real estate. And not just wealth as in dollars and cents, but in the quality of your life, the quality of your community, and just enriching uh, enriching what exists around you. So you want to learn more? Click on the link to Home Prop in the podcast description and give them a shot.